freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer. You are my promise land. You are my deliverer. The freedom I'm living in. Oh, you are my deliverer. You are my promise land.
Here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, God willing, and it went well first service, um, we will complete our study of not only 2 Timothy today, but also of the pastoral epistles, and we've titled this series, Blueprint for a Healthy Church. And I'm not going to do much of a review, but what I will tell you, just in case maybe you're here for the first or second time, or just tuning in online for the first time, these three letters that we call the pastoral epistles were written by the Apostle Paul to, you, to two young pastors who had some hard assignments. They were both pastoring in areas where the gospel was being challenged and where, where the churches were under a lot of false teaching and they were adopting false practices. So at one point, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I write these things that you may know how to conduct yourself in the church which is the house of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So Paul is saying, pastors, this is how you conduct yourself. You teach the word, et cetera, et cetera. And people, this is how you conduct yourselves in the church. And so today we're going to finish. And we're titling today's message, But the Lord. And you're going to see it's a very personal portion of scripture, but I know that, that Ken asked you to sit, then Ken asked you to stand, and then Ken told you to sit. I'm going to ask you to stand again, um, and we're going to read God's Word together. I keep getting asked, how, how come we're standing and reading? Because the Scriptures command us to, to publicly read God's Word. So we're going to read our text today. I'm going to ask you to read loud and bold, but what I want you to do is I want you to try to feel this text because these are the last recorded words of the Apostle Paul. And there is a lot of emotion and a lot of feeling in these words. So begin with me at verse 9. Paul says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And to Kikos I have sent to Ephesus, 
Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. And then, please, just this last verse, I really want you to hear this. Paul says, The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we've, we've read your word. We've worshipped you. Lord, now we want to pray that as we look at these final words of the Apostle Paul, that you would help us, Lord, to identify with him, to be able to understand, Lord, the challenges that he was facing, but the grace that he was experiencing. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and minister to us. There's much application in these words that we just read. I pray, Lord, that you would better equip us to reach this world with the good news of Jesus Christ and just to live for you, Lord. And so with that, we pray that you'd send your spirit to be our teacher, and we just give you this time for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Last week's message was just verses 6 through 8, and we titled that message, How to Live and Die Well. And we were looking at the beginning of Paul's final words. But what we were really looking at was Paul's personal view of his upcoming death. And we saw three things that I just want to remind you of. Paul gave us his personal perspective of death. Paul called it a departure. And what's interesting is that throughout the New Testament, there are a number of Greek words used to describe death. For non-believers, there's one word. For believers in Jesus Christ... There's another word. But Paul chose a third word that was used only here in all of the New Testament. And it was the word departure. And Paul is communicating to us. He's saying that because his faith was in the finished work of Jesus, he knew that when his life here on earth ended, that he would be immediately ushered into the presence of his Savior, Jesus Christ. Not because of his good works, not because he was part of the right religious sect or anything like that, because his sins had been forgiven by his faith in the finished work of Jesus. He knew that the moment his life here on on earth ended, it would be the, the end of his toil and labor and that he would go on to his reward in Christ's kingdom. And then we also saw Paul's perspective of life. Paul used a picture from the Jewish worship in the temple. And he said that his life was like a living sacrifice and his death would be like the outpouring of of wine upon that sacrifice, a sweet-smelling aroma in the Lord's nostrils. And then the last thing we looked at last week was, was Paul's confidence. He said, listen, I am able to go into eternity with absolutely no regrets. He said, it's because I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And Paul says, because of that, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me, and not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. And so Paul was completely confident that he was going to be with Jesus when this life ended. And so up to this point, what Paul has been doing is he's kind of been setting his apostolic affairs in order. He says to Timothy, listen, you've got some big shoes to fill when I die. And so 
Here's how you need to conduct yourself as a pastor. Here's how you need to conduct yourself as a man of God. But now what Paul does is he begins in verse 9 to set his personal affairs in order. And what Paul's going to be focusing on here in this text is people. Paul names no less than 18 individuals in these verses that we just read. And then in verse 21, he uses the phrase, the brethren, to refer to the members of the church at Rome. And he refers to the believers in the church at Ephesus. And what Paul is doing is he's doing his best to make sure that his earthly relationships are in order as he prepares to leave. And and so before we even get into our text today, we have an application. And that is we learned last week that none of us know the time that we are going to leave this earth. And so how important is it that we are examining our relationships? First and foremost, our relationship with heaven. Are we in a faith-based relationship with the Lord that assures that when we die, we're going to go into the presence of the Lord? I hope yes. That's what the gospel is all about, preparing us for eternity. But, but Paul is also going to teach us today that we need to evaluate our earthly relationships. And the good ones, Paul is going to say, build them. And the ones that are broken and stressed, Paul is going to tell us, we need to do everything in our power to reconcile those. So with those thoughts in mind, let's jump into our final study here in the pastoral epistles. By looking at verse 9, I want to put it up on the screen. And Paul says this, he says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Now, quite often I have challenged you to go beyond being a simple Bible reader and growing to the point where you would be a Bible student. And to do that, you're going to have to get yourself some tools. I'll give you a a free one. Find Blue Letter Bible, download the app onto your phone or look at it on the computer. It is one of the best tools that you can own. It gives you all sorts of Bible translations. It gives you commentaries, but the most important thing to me is it gives you a Greek and Hebrew interlinear. And you can go look at the words that are used, and this is one of those portions of Scripture where we have an example why it's so important to be a a Bible student instead of just a simple Bible reader. Because as you look at this phrase in English, be diligent to come to me quickly, you kind of get this idea that Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, if and when you happen to get around to leaving Ephesus and coming to Rome, um, maybe we could grab a coffee, you know. That is not what Paul is saying. Those words, be diligent, when you look at the verb tense, you realize that this is not a request, this is a command. And it's the kind of command that came from a commanding officer to a subordinate. And so Paul says, Timothy, I need you. And I need you so bad that I need you to finish up whatever you're doing there in Ephesus and you need to get to Rome as quickly as you possibly can. And that sets the tone for the rest of the morning. And before I get into the next section, I'm just going to tell you something because I had to tell first service because it was already happening. And I was trying to hide it and I'm trying to hide it right now and I can't. I am extremely emotional this morning. I have um, studied the pastoral epistles and the life of Paul for over 30 years. I've had the privilege of teaching through the New Testament multiple times. And whenever I teach the end of the Gospels where we see Jesus die, or especially the pastoral epistles where we watch Paul die, I have a hard time controlling my emotions. And this morning I'm extremely emotional. I, I... thanked God for this godly man that came to me right after first service and he gave me a hug and he said, he said, before you even said that, I was already almost crying knowing what we were going to study. I was like, I'm not the only one. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) I'm incredibly emotional this morning because although I, I consider myself a follower of Jesus Christ, I also consider myself a disciple of the Apostle Paul. I, I have learned much from him. I've learned much about Jesus and about life and about pastoral ministry from the man whose death we're going to be reading about today. And so, I want you to feel this Bible study. I want you to experience the depths of what Paul is talking about. And it begins 
Here, Paul's going to give us a number of reasons why he needed Timothy. And, and the first is simply Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, Paul was lonely. Verses 10 through 12, we're going to see reasons why, but I just want you to think about something. The Apostle Paul's conversion is recorded for us in Acts chapter 9. And, and he, he was Saul of Tarsus, a Jewish Pharisee who was arresting and dragging Christians back to Jerusalem and trying to get them to deny Christ. He would even kill them. And Paul's on his way to Damascus, and, and as he's moving towards the city, he's knocked to the ground by the bright light that shines down on him from heaven. And, and he cries out, and, and Jesus says, Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And, 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 and Saul says, who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? And over the next few verses, we see Saul's salvation. He gets saved, and it is a very personal interaction between Paul and Jesus. There was no human evangelist involved. Paul goes into the city of Damascus and he's blind. And now Jesus brings another human being into the equation and he talks to this guy named Ananias. And he says, Ananias, I want you to go and in this particular place you're going to find Saul of Tarsus and I want you to go lay hands on him. And like a good follower of Jesus Christ, Ananias questions the Lord. Lord, are you sure? Because we've all heard what a bad dude this guy is. And in a sense, Ananias is saying, Jesus, I think he's faking it so that he can infiltrate our ranks and kill more of us. And the Lord assures Ananias that this is a true salvation, and then he speaks a prophecy over the apostle Paul's future. Look up on the screen, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And Jesus says this, he says, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel. And over the next three and a half decades, this prophecy would be fulfilled as Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the Apostle and spends the rest of his life on multiple missionary journeys taking the gospel. It begins where he leaves Antioch and he takes the gospel to what we know as modern-day Turkey. It was called Asia Minor then. On his next missionary journey, he takes the gospel all the way to Europe. He comes back to Jerusalem. He's arrested. He spends two years in prison in Caesarea Philippi, and then he's sent to Rome. And he spends what appears to be about a total of another two years in prison, and then he's released. And at that point, the Bible doesn't record what happened with Paul's life, but history tells us that Paul fulfilled a lifelong vision to take the gospel to Spain. And then he was arrested again, imprisoned, and we've been reading about that in 2 Timothy. But I want you to look at this map up on the screen. We've got here what is kind of called four missionary journeys of Paul. And can you imagine the hundreds or thousands or maybe even 10,000s people that Paul met while taking the gospel around the world? Paul knew a lot of people. And yet here, at the end of his life, Paul is lonely. In verse 10 and 11 and 12, share with us why he was lonely. Look, look at verse 10. He says, For Demas has forsaken me. Now Demas is a man who appears three times in the New Testament. We know very little about him. But if you look at his, the appearance of his name in a chronological order, it begins in Philemon, then we read about him in Colossians, and then in 2 Timothy. The first time Paul calls him a fellow laborer, later in Colossians Paul simply mentions him. And now in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says that Demas has forsaken him. And this word that Paul chose for forsaken is really interesting. In the Bible, it's translated as to desert or to leave someone helpless. But if you look at the same Greek word in ancient Greek literature, it's used to describe abandoning a fellow soldier behind enemy lines. And Paul says, here I am in Rome. We are behind enemy lines sharing the gospel, and one of my closest associates has abandoned me. He has forsaken me. He has left me as a fellow soldier 
wounded behind enemy lines. And one of the reasons why is because Demas was no longer fighting the good fight. He was no longer running his race. He had not kept the faith. And you may say, why? And the text actually tells us. Before I read it to you, I want to remind you that last week Paul said something. I've already quoted it once today, but Paul said, the key to my faithfulness, the reason that I have been able to endure so much is because I have loved the Lord's appearing. Paul was waiting for the rapture of the church. Demas loved something different. Notice verse 10, Demas, Paul says, loved this present world, and so he has departed for Thessalonica. And over the years, as I've studied and taught about Demas, I like to sum him up by saying that Demas never developed an eternal perspective for his life. So when Paul got arrested and when things got rough in Demas' life, instead of him saying, it's okay, because there is laid up for me a crown when I see Jesus face to face, he went back to what many commentators and scholars say was the safety of comfort and ease of Christianity in Thessalonica. Maybe kind of like being a Christian in America. Anybody suffered lately for being a Christian in America? I mean really suffered. Yeah, I haven't either. You know. And so maybe it's kind of like going on a, a mission trip and seeing how some of our missionaries live and then we're, we're like, man, I thought I was called to go and to serve with Mike Pratt in, in Ukraine or with Kosti in Romania, but I went on a mission trip and I I just want to read my Bible at Starbucks, you know. It's kind of what Demas had done. But, but I want to share something with you, and I hope this ministers to somebody. I want you to notice that Demas forsook Paul, but nowhere does Paul say that he became an apostate or he had no future in ministry. And I'm using that just to kind of prime you, and I want you to hold that thought, and I'll return to it in verse 11. So just bear with me for a minute. Paul gives us more reasons for his loneliness. Look at the rest of verse 10. He says, Crescens departed for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. And then jumping to verse 12, to Kikos I have sent to Ephesus. So Paul's got three other men who had departed from him also, but these guys departed for proper reasons. Uh, I want to go through and talk to you about these men because some of them, the Bible speaks a great deal of and some not much. Like for instance, Crescens here in verse 10, this is the only place that his name appears in the New Testament. But what really impresses me is that we really know quite a bit about him because Paul included his name in a list of other faithful men. He, he included him with Titus, who had previously pastored the churches on the island of Crete, and whom Paul had now sent to Dalmatia, which is former Yugoslavia. He puts Crescens with Luke, who had remained at Paul's side until the moment of his death. He put Crescens with Mark, who Paul said was profitable to him for ministry. And, and he puts Crescens' name alongside Tukikos here, whose name means faithful, and whom Paul, oh my gosh, can I just pause for a minute? If you ever wake up one day and you say, you know what, I want to do a character study in, in some biblical person so that I can learn about them and maybe imitate them, take a morning and dig through your Bible and learn about Tukikos, this guy here. His name means faithful, and, and Paul trusted him to deliver those letters that we know as the prison epistles to the churches that he wrote them to. Now, that's a big thing. You don't just give Scripture to anybody to carry them and deliver them. But he had also pastored the churches at Crete after Titus' departure. Paul was now sending him to step in as pastor at the church at Ephesus so Timothy could come to Rome. Tukikos is one of those guys that every pastor wants to have around him. He's that guy that you look at and you go, hey, I need something. And the guy goes, anything. What do you need? Well, I need you to deliver something. Okay. What do you need now? I need you to go pastor a church that needs a pastor. Okay, I'm gone. And then you just let me know what you need after that. These are great guys to have around you in ministry. And, and Paul includes to Kikos uh, 
you know, as an example of, of what a, a Christian leader should be or even what a Christian should be. I would encourage you to seek to be like this man. Not only for Jesus, but for a, for a leader, for someone else in your life, to, to be that, that person who can walk up to maybe your boss at work or maybe some leader in the church and just say to them, listen, I am here and whatever you need of me, use me. You know, um, I like that. I, I like having men like that around me. Because I know what I'm called to do. And when I step here in, on a Sunday and I find out that, that's, can I just be blunt, someone lost their cookies in the, in the bathroom and there's a mess. And I can say to someone, can you go take care of that? Yeah, I'll go do that. Okay, also, I'm going to be gone next week. Can you teach? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Those are the kind of people that church leaders want around them. And Paul had just this great group of guys, but he had to say goodbye to them. And we see here that Crescens and, and Titus, they probably made a special trip to see Paul in prison at Rome, to speak to him and encourage him. And Paul has to send them on to their next ministry assignment. They, they probably all prayed together. They probably gave each other a, a big hug. And Paul laid hands on them, and with his blessing, he sent them off to their next ministry destination. And so in verse 11, we see God's faithfulness to Paul during this season of loneliness, and it came in the form of two other men. And this is interesting. Look at verse 11. Paul says, only Luke is with me. Now I want you to pretend you're Luke. And Paul has just said, I had all these great companions and I've sent them away to go do great works for Christ and other places and only Luke's with me. Can you imagine being Luke? Like, thanks, Paul. I have been serving you faithfully for a long time. And you write that, but literally what Paul is saying is that I used to lead a, a big, effective team of men and that team has been whittled down to one. And thank God it was Luke is kind of what Paul is saying. If you want to do another character study, Luke's a great one. As you're studying the book of Acts, you'll notice in the first 15 chapters, it's written in uh, second person or even third person. Luke keeps saying, and they went here and they did this. But you get into the 16th chapter and all of a sudden Luke starts using different language. He brings it into first person. He says, and then we went. And so what we see is on Paul's second missionary journey, they were probably on the west end of what we call Asia Minor when Paul got that call to go to Macedonia. And it seems like that's when Luke joined them. And so as they took the gospel to Europe, Luke is now part of the team. And as you study through the scriptures, you find Luke was a physician. And he served faithfully with Paul until the moment that Paul was executed. And so Paul also had a, another guy that he wanted. I want you to notice verse 11. He says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Remember a couple of minutes ago, I told you not to judge Demas too harshly. Demas had forsaken Paul, loving this present world, and he had fled for what we believe to be the ease of Thessalonica. Well, about 25 years before what we're reading, and the context is found in Acts chapter 13, Barnabas and Paul were ministering in the church at Antioch, Syria, and the Holy Spirit speaks, and he says, set apart unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so the elders there prayed and sent them off on what we call Paul's first missionary journey. And Acts 13 records that they took with them Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, as their assistant. And so just picture it. You know, Paul and Barnabas are about to go on their first missionary journey. And they're like, you know, we need a helper. Got this guy. I'll go. I want to go. So like, all right, we'll take him, right? 
So they get to the first place that they're going to do ministry, the island of Cyprus, and they come across a demon-possessed guy. And then they leave there, and they travel to southern Turkey, as we know it, and they have to traverse the Taurus Mountains that are known to be filled with robbers and murderers, and malaria was everywhere. And John Mark gets bugged, I think, because the leadership of the team changes from Barnabas to Saul taking over. We see the names change. It's no longer Barnabas and Saul. It's Paul and Barnabas. And John Mark is like, I am out of here. And he abandoned them, and he went back to Jerusalem. Fast forward to Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas are back home and they're planning their second missionary journey. And Barnabas tells Paul, hey, we'll take John Mark with us. And to use a loose interpretation of the Greek, Paul says, over my dead body. And Barnabas and Paul had such a sharp dispute that Barnabas took John Mark and they went one direction and Saul chose a companion and went a different direction. And this situation was bad. But in time, Paul and Barnabas reconciled and more importantly, Mark matured. And we don't know where Mark was, but Paul tells Timothy, go get him and bring him to me. And look at the wording. Please look at your Bible. Paul says, he is useful to me in ministry. That word useful is normally in the New Testament translated profitable. You see, he once abandoned us and he was of no profit, of no use to us. But Paul says, this young man has grown. And he is now profitable to me for ministry. And I don't know how it happened, but I'm going to speculate. All right? Have you ever been in a broken relationship with somebody? Have, have you ever, like, had a person that you had to just say, you know what, I can't hang out with you anymore? You know, the Bible tells us how to reconcile broken relationships, but... But this was a ministry relationship. Paul was an authority in John Mark's life. And in a sense, he abandoned someone that he was called to help. And Maybe there's someone in this room or someone watching online and you got involved in ministry at one point, but you got bugged and you jumped ship and it's a broken relationship and it's not yet been reconciled. I feel strongly today that God is telling you, go fix that. Maybe you were part of a church and you were part of a leadership team and, you know, something happened. And rather than leaving the right way or whatever happened, you allowed this to turn into a broken ministry relationship. At some point, let me just kind of tell you what's going to happen. How do I know this? Because I'm a pastor. And I've had lots of people who get bugged with me and they, they get upset and they jump ship. One day you're going to be walking into Starbucks to get a cup of coffee on the way to work. And the person that you're in a broken relationship with is going to be walking out of Starbucks. That door's going to open as you're going in and you're going to come face to face with that person. And you guys are going to do that little dance. Oh, hey, how's it going? I hope you're doing great. Love you, bro. See you later. And then as you both go separate directions, you're both going, I hate your guts. You know, rah, 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 rah. And I wonder if Paul coming into the Jewish temple on one of his ministry trips, he's just coming into worship and he comes around the corner and he and Timothy bounce foreheads. Timothy, how you doing? Paul, hey, how you doing? You know, God puts them together and they got to kind of look each other in the eye. And I wonder if that wasn't a moment where did I say Timothy? I meant to say John Mark. Where, where John Mark might have just looked at Paul and said, hey, can we talk? When I went on that mission trip with you, I was not ready for the spiritual warfare. I was not mature enough to be where I was at, and I left you hanging. And, and Paul, I need to ask your forgiveness. I caused a rift between you and Barnabas and what do I need to do to make that right? And I wonder if Paul didn't just look at him and say, you just did. I love you, bro. And they went their separate ways. And now all these years later, Paul 
We don't know where Mark was at, but he writes to Timothy and he says, go find Mark and bring him because I want to train that man and I want to send him out to do ministry because I'm going to be dead soon and we need as many soldiers on the battlefield as possible. I just love that story. So here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. If Mark's past desertion of Paul could be reconciled, could not Demas's? Yes. All it would take was for Demas to go and talk to Paul and make it right. If Mark's and Demas's can be made right, maybe the one you're struggling with right now can too. And I would encourage you to do a study on biblical conflict resolution and go do your part and fix whatever broken relationship you're dealing with. Paul was not only lonely, I have to speed up a little bit. Paul was impoverished. We're going to be looking at verse 13 and 21, but I want to remind you as you're trying to find verse 13 in your Bible, I want you to remember that Paul wasn't in what we would call a jail cell. It was not 10 feet wide and 20 feet deep with, with bars and a toilet and a sink where they gave three square meals and he got recreation time in the yard. Paul was in a cold, damp dungeon that was under the jail. If this was actually where we believe it was, a place called the Mamertine Prison, this prison was constructed as a place for Rome's enemies to be dealt with. So Paul is seen as an enemy of Rome. He's been sentenced to death, so the only care that he would receive would come from believers who took the time to come and to minister to him, maybe to bring him food or something like that. And so Paul, being impoverished, look what he writes in verse 13. He says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. And then jump to verse 21. It goes hand in hand with this. He says, do your utmost to come before winter. Now at this point in history, there was a law in Rome that a Roman soldier could equip himself with the possessions of the people that they arrested. We saw this in the life of Jesus. When they arrested him, they took his cloak, right? His garments. And it's possible that Paul and Timothy were near or even at the city of Troas when Paul got word that he was about to be arrested. And so we speculate that maybe Paul went and found this friend named Carpus that lives at Troas and he left his only worldly possessions with this man so that the Roman soldiers wouldn't steal everything that he had. And so I want you to notice now what Paul asks Timothy to bring. He says, go by Troas and pick up my stuff. And he says, you know, bring me a cloak. It sheds a little bit of light on Paul's situation. Have you ever been underground? Have you ever been, I grew up in New Mexico. We have this place called Carlsbad Caverns. Anybody ever heard of it? It's amazing. And you get, you can take stairs or you can take an elevator, but you go way down underground. I mean, you are way down there. And the first thing you notice, it's cold. The earth is cold and Paul is in this cold, damp dungeon. And he doesn't even have a coat to keep him warm. A a cloak was like a big poncho. It slipped over your head. It went all the way down almost to your feet and you could wrap up in it like a blanket. And, And Paul is saying, listen, I'm cold, and just to use a little bit of humor, I'll just say Paul was telling Timothy, I don't want to die of cold before they cut my head off. Sorry, I just had to do it because I'm still struggling with my emotions here. Verse 21 sheds some light also on on why Paul tells Timothy to be diligent to come to him quickly. He, He says, listen, I'm freezing. Bring me my jacket. But then another thing is that most ships didn't travel across the Adriatic Sea in the winter because of storms. It was too dangerous. So Paul is telling Timothy, if you don't make haste and you don't catch a ship across the sea before winter, you're going to be stuck and you're not going to make it here and I don't think I'm going to live till spring. So he's saying, Timothy, this is really important. And then another thing, he says, I want you to bring me my books books, especially the parchments. And I'll use modern terms here. Paul is basically saying, I need my Bible and I need my study resources. And I love this about Paul because he's on his, he's on death row. He's on his way out of this world, but he refused to stop living and to stop growing. 
And I just want to share an example with you. My mother turned 88 a couple of weeks ago. And mom is really struggling with eyesight. She can't hear. She's got dementia. You know, it's, it's a real struggle. Pray for my mom. Kelly and I are caring for my parents. My stepdad is Roger. Please pray for him. Roger's really, really going downhill with his health. It's, it's a real struggle right now. But, but my mom, 88 years old, and years ago she wrote a series of children's books, and a publisher accepted them and was publishing and distributing them, and then this publisher stole from my mother and over 2,500 other artists and musicians and stuff, and, and basically stole their resources and their, their rights and money and all this. There was this huge lawsuit and nobody got anything. And my mom, 88 years old, is constantly calling me and saying, come over, I want to talk to you about something. So I come over and she says, I want to get my books out. I want to get my books out. You know, she's 88 years old and instead of saying, you know, hey, my recliner's no longer comfortable or I want a new TV, mom still wants to do something. And I love that. And I want all of us to think about Paul, and you can use my mom, Angie, as an example if you want. Paul is in this place in life where he knew he was about to die, yet he refused to stop living and growing. And, and there's two things here. He prepared himself to meet Jesus at any moment, and we saw that last week. This week, we're looking at the fact that Paul planned and prepared as if he still had time left. So he says, Timothy, I know I'm going to die, but I don't know when, so bring me my Bible and bring me my study resources because I want to continue training other men for the ministry and I want to continue growing in Christ. In Ephesians 5 and Colossians 4, Paul wrote about redeeming the time. And I think what Paul is trying to communicate is he looks at all of the years before he ever got saved as a waste of time. And he wakes up one day and he says, okay, I'm a Christian now, I've only got a certain amount of time left. I want to redeem all of those years that I wasted. I want to make every moment of my life count for Christ's kingdom. So I just hit you with a quick question. How are you spending your time? Could it be that the Lord is telling you today that it's a season of your life or maybe a transition where you need less Netflix and more time in the Word? You know, less time on the golf course and, and maybe more time finding a younger person to disciple and to pour yourself into. I think that's important in the day and age. So Paul's changing gears now, and he begins talking to Timothy about a recent court trial that he went through. What I want to show you here is that Paul was not only lonely, Paul was not only in need, but he had recently suffered two very wounding betrayals. Before I read you from verse 14 through 16, I, I, I want to do something. I've done this many times. I want you to picture now that we're watching a movie. And up on the screen, it flashes something like three months ago or a little while back, something to communicate that what we're about to see on the screen took place in the near past, and now the camera pans from Paul's dungeon to a Roman courtroom. And look at verse 14. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. So let's set the scene here with verse 16. Paul says, he uses this phrase, my, my first defense. He's, he's talking about a recent hearing before probably Caesar Nero, where he was brought up on trial. And at such trials, it was common to hear advocates for the accused. And, and Paul says, listen, I, I got dragged into court. Everybody I've sent away to go do ministry, so I had nobody to speak for me. So I had to depend on those Christians in Rome, and I needed someone to step up. But Paul says, no one came to speak on my behalf. Notice he says, but rather, all forsook me. And this is most likely because of two things. One, I already said, Paul had sent a bunch of his associates away. But 
in Rome at the time that we're reading about, it had become extremely dangerous to be a Christian. And the Roman Christians knew that to go and stand in a court of law and to speak on Paul's behalf would probably result in them being arrested very shortly also. So Paul says, nobody stood with me. And, and I want you to put yourself in Paul's shoes. Who in here would feel a little bit offended, a little bit abandoned? And I'll tell you that I would too. But I'll show you that Paul was probably hurt, but I don't think he was actually offended. He, he says this, he says, may it not be charged against them. I think what Paul was doing was trying to reflect Jesus. Look up at the screen. Luke 23, verse 34, records Jesus' words when he was being crucified as an innocent man between two thieves. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. I think Paul was basically saying, listen, most humans, even most Christians, would fail under these circumstances. And, and Paul says, Jesus, please, just forgive them. Don't hold this against them. But now look at this second wounding that Paul experienced. It, it comes in verse 14. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. We're not sure, but we think this is the same Alexander that Paul spoke of in 1 Timothy 1. And this was a guy who was part of the Ephesian church, and he began to spread false doctrines and introduce unbiblical practices to the church and things got so bad that Paul had to exercise what we call official church discipline this man had to be removed from the church and it appears that all of these years later Alexander took his bitterness out on Paul by traveling to Rome and testifying against him in front of Nero and that's what Paul says when he says Alexander the coppersmith did be much harm he spoke against Paul, adding to his problems there. And I think Paul's response really needs to be looked at. Paul had a twofold response to this, and I want you to pay close attention. First, he says, may the Lord repay him according to his works. Who hears a little snarkiness in that? May the Lord repay him according to his works, right? I don't think it was snarky. I really don't, because as you compare Scripture to Scripture, if you go to Romans 12, Paul's teaching the believers who had been wronged to follow the example of David in Psalm 62, where David basically says, hey, rather than seeking vengeance, what we should do is we should pray for the offending person to come to repentance and to experience God's mercy and then if they don't come to repentance, we can trust that God is going to deal with them according to their works because God is fair and God is righteous. And Paul is now practicing what he preached to others. I think Paul prayed for Alexander regularly, especially for his repentance and his restoration. But he says, listen, if this man doesn't repent, God's going to have to deal with him. But as we look at verse 15, I want you to see the other side of the coin Paul says to Timothy, you also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. And what Paul is saying here to Timothy as a fellow pastor, he, he's saying, Timothy, you and I have a job to protect the church. And when there are men or women in the church and they are greatly resisting the word of God as we're teaching it and as we're instructing people in it those people need to be separated from the church sometimes they're going to have to be named sometimes people are going to have to be warned about them and Paul is saying Timothy our, our job is, as church leaders is sometimes to bring to the attention of the church people who are going to lead them astray and I'll just share a little testimony here. I am not scared at all. If I see something in the larger Christian community to say to you guys, hey, be careful. There's this guy out on YouTube, and he is super popular right now, but he's teaching a false doctrine called this or that. And inevitably, I get one or two emails, and someone says, thank you so much for being a shepherd. Thank you for protecting us, and we, we love that you are willing to do that. But for every one... 
of those, I'll get maybe five, eight, or ten of the, you know, Pastor Randy, Jesus said, judge not. But I can handle those emails knowing that I have that responsibility. And I try to do it well. I, I, I try to do it in a, in a godly manner. But I think it's important. We, I think it's important that you warn each other when there's that stuff going on. When someone comes to you and goes, hey, have you, you seen this guy on YouTube? That's where you should go, oh, you need to not be listening to that guy. He's very dangerous, okay? Look at the last thing here. Paul was alone. He's impoverished. He had suffered the wounds of betrayal. And yet I want to show you in verses 17 and 18, he just has this overwhelming peace, and I want to show you why. I want you to continue picturing this picture of the Roman courtroom. And I want you to picture Paul standing there. And the trial is about to begin, and Paul's looking around the room, and the courtroom is filled. It seems like everybody in Rome has come out to attend Paul's trial, and he looks around the room, and he has no companions. He's really struggling with what's going on, but it gets really bad as he looks at the doors, and Alexander the coppersmith walks in with the prosecuting attorney, and Paul is like, oh, Lord, this is not going to go well. And then Paul just stands there and smiles, maybe even looking at Nero and just smiling at him. And Nero's thinking, what is wrong with this crazy man? But what's going through Paul's mind is he's recounting the final hours of Jesus' life. And he's remembering that Jesus was betrayed by a former associate. He was forsaken by all of his disciples whom Jesus had called his friends. He was arrested on false charges. When the false accusations were made against him in a court of law, nobody stood with him and those offended with him made false accusations and even hired false witnesses against him. Jesus was stripped of his few earthly possessions and as he bore the sin of all mankind on the cross, he experienced something that he had never, ever experienced before, which was the loneliness of separation from his father. Because as the sin of all mankind was placed upon his shoulders there on the cross, the father, according to the hymn that we sing, turned his face away. And for those hours, Jesus experienced the loneliness of broken fellowship with his father even crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he died, an innocent man. And having suffered through all of those things as an example, Paul in verse 17 says, but the Lord. But the Lord Jesus stood with me, he says, and he strengthened me. And Paul is standing there saying, Jesus has experienced everything I'm about to experience, and he's going to give me the grace and the strength to go through this. And so, Paul says here, so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. We're still looking at the Roman courtroom. So, Alexander the coppersmith has spoken against Paul. Maybe other people have. And then they look at Paul and they say, what do you have to say? And Paul says, well, it started out when I was born a Jewish man in Israel. And I thought that my righteousness was going to get me to heaven. But eventually I realized I needed a Savior, and his name was Jesus. And Paul preaches the gospel to the entire courtroom. He preaches the gospel in front of Nero. And rather than defend himself, he just clearly preaches the gospel. And then this miracle happened because Paul is fully expecting that as he's preaching the gospel, they're, they're just going to kill him. And look at verse 17. He says, "'Also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion.'" There's a lot of people who believe that what Paul is saying is that they threw me in the Roman Colosseum and I had to fight lions and God delivered me. We, we have no record of that. But what we do have is Psalm chapter 22 where David is using the illustration of being delivered from the mouth of a lion as an example of being 
delivered from the hand of ungodly men. And I think that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I fully expected for Nero to kill me that day. And the Lord delivered me. He gave me another day to live. And so now, picture Paul. He's taken back to his cell. The words present day flash across the screen. And Paul is there in his dungeon. And he writes verse 18. And he says, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul had just told us, hey, I was delivered from Nero's wrath. He, he should have killed me that day, but he didn't. But Paul knows, soon Nero will kill me. But he writes these words here. And so many scholars and commentators agree when Paul says that the Lord would deliver him from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom, that Paul was commenting on the fact that he knew his own sin nature was still strong and that he was possibly struggling with that idea that just like so many Christians before him had denied Christ at the moment of execution, Paul was thinking, maybe I'm going to deny Christ. Maybe I'm not strong enough. Maybe I'm going to deny Christ and bring shame to the name of the gospel. And then all at once, the Holy Spirit ministers to him, and he says, I know the Lord is going to deliver me from every evil work, from even my own weakness. And we know from history that Paul never denied the Lord. So I'll give you the conclusion. Verses 19 through 22 at the end of Paul's life, he's thinking about two things. And the first is the people that had made his life full. He's already named a bunch of them, but look at verse 19. He's, he says to Timothy, Greet Prisca and Aquila. In other parts of the New Testament, this is Priscilla and Aquila. This was a husband and wife team that had ministered with Paul in many places, and they were now serving with Timothy in Ephesus. Paul says, say hi to them. I will never get to say hi to them again. And then he says, greet the household of Onesiphorus. This is a guy that encouraged and refreshed Paul many times during his imprisonments. Verse 20, he says, Erastus stayed at Corinth. This is a guy who served with Paul at Corinth. And then he served with Timothy in Macedonia. Paul says, greet him. And now look at this one. He says, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. This is a whole study right here. Because there's a lot of people who say that once you're a Christian, God guarantees you perfect health and wealth and trouble-free life. Nobody told Trophimus and Paul about that. Because this guy was sick and obviously Paul probably prayed for him. Luke probably tried to doctor him, but he was still sick. And just please don't fall for that trap in the word of faith or the prosperity movement that God promises you perfect health and wealth and trouble-free life. It is not biblical. We've got a guy here that Paul said, hey, I, I, I had to leave him because he was sick. Either Trophimus didn't have enough faith or Paul didn't have enough faith, or that is a false doctrine. And I believe it's a false doctrine very clearly. He says here, we got a few more people. He says, Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Holy Spirit chose to put a group of people together here that we know really nothing about. They were unknown to us, but they were precious to Paul. And so Paul says, listen, people are important. Say hi to these people for me. And then the second thing that Paul is focusing on is the end of the epistle here, verse 22. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you, amen. Paul says to Timothy, the grace of God has absolutely transformed my life. And it is the thing that I will focus on. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ, Timothy, I pray that he will be with you and that you will experience the same grace that I have experienced all these years. And then he says, amen, and the letter ends. Paul just draws it to a close, bringing final attention to Jesus and the grace of God. 
But what's interesting is that the Bible doesn't record the final days of Paul, but tradition tells us that he had already been found guilty. He had been sentenced to death. And there came a day where the executioner came and got him, took him outside of the city, stripped him naked, and beheaded him. And that was the end of the life of the Apostle Paul, but he went out the way he had lived, boldly and full of faith. And so, because of his confidence in Jesus, Paul was able not only to live well, but to die well. And so I'll leave you with just a simple ending today. Having studied the pastoral epistles, you and I have been given everything that we need both to live well, but also to die well. And I challenge you today, church, live sober-mindedly. None of us knows when we are going to go see the Lord. But like Paul, we can live every single day with the confidence that because our faith is in the finished work of Jesus, our eternity is already a done deal. We're going to heaven because of what Jesus did. The question is, how are we going to go out? And like Paul, I challenge you, expect the rapture of the church at any moment and live for the glory of God with all that you've got. Amen? Father, these words that we've read today for me are just so emotional. They're so sobering to see that even the great apostle Paul, having preached about how he had run the race, he had kept the faith, he had fought the good fight, there was that moment where he just said, I'm not going to depend on myself. I know that it is he that is going to get me to the finish line well. And so I pray for all of us today, Lord. None of us would be prideful or overconfident. I pray that each of us would have heaven sorted out, knowing that our sins have been forgiven by putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus but Lord, that that's the starting line, not the finish line, that our hearts would be prepared to run this race with perseverance and that the spirit of Jesus Christ would be with us and the grace of God would be with us and that we would be ready to run with perseverance as we tell everybody around us about Jesus. And so to that end, Lord, we just commit ourselves to you. Let us live the way Paul lived, let us die the way Paul died, all for your glory, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
part of losing myself in bringing you praise to the last. Your light will shine.